Here is your host, John McElroy. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine this week. The topic today is all about advanced technology in the automotive industry, or even at the Consumer Electronics Show, which is where we're at right now. Is this going to change the automotive industry as we know it? I think it is, but who cares what I think? I've got three experts to discuss this, including Ken Washington, the Vice President of Research and Advanced Engineering at the Ford Motor Company, Frankie James, the Managing Director for General Motors Advanced Technology at their Silicon Valley office, and Arvid Niestrov, the CEO of Mercedes-Benz R&D in North America. Great to have all of you here. Thank you. Great to be here. Ken, let's start talking out with you about CES. I, why so much technology from the automotive industry at this show? Why not some of the other shows like the SAE show or any of the other automotive shows? Why CES? Well, this is the place to be for, for te where technology begins. I even saw it on a sign, you know, this is where technology begins. If you walk the show floor, you can see technologies that are relevant to our vehicles today and they're going to change the face of transportation and our vehicles for the next 5, 10, 15 years. We're excited to be here. We've been here for many years and we plan to continue to come. This is the place to find up, out about the trend in technology and to make it all happen. So we're, we're really great to be, we're glad to be here. Frankie, you see it the same way? Absolutely, there is so much that's going on here that's you know, potentially gonna be relevant for future vehicles and the future of transportation. Um, we've got Mary Barra giving a keynote this afternoon. We're truly excited about that. There's gonna be a big announcement about the new Chevrolet Bolt. So it's just a great show. How about you, Arvid? I think it really, it really is also reasoned by the Silicon Valley radiating out here to Nevada. So lots of things going on there. Many people having an easy travel to come here, show their technology. And it's really exciting to see that not only, I think last year was very strong when automotive sort of took over, but this year, the first press conference I went to two days ago already was 60% about auto. And even if it was a chip company. So we're really, we're really driving things forward. And it's just uh, interesting to see how the two worlds of digitalization and automotive now really come together and create new exciting things. Well, well you asked right, right, right at the front, you know, why, why CES, right? And I, you know, I, I believe it's, it's CES has become really a lot about autos because the automobile has become the, the like the ultimate mobility device, right? So mobility is about automotive and the face of mobility is changing because of the promise of technology. Just think about how people have been mobile over decades, over centuries. It, you know, they still spend hour to hour and a half being mobile every day. But what's changed is the fact that technology has allowed people to go further, go faster, and go differently. And that's going to be continuing. And the ultimate mobility device being the car, I think is why CES and, mo and, mo and automobiles go together like, you know, like bread and butter. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. bread and butter. Frankie, you got to believe too that the automotive industry is on a cusp of a huge technological change, don't you? Absolutely. I mean, you know, what we're saying at GM is that there's more change going to happen in the next five years than we've seen in the last 50. And the big pushes right now around autonomy, connectivity, electrification, and vehicle sharing. And all of those, in my opinion, are so fundamentally related to software. They're software driven. This is not mechanical engineering anymore. This is a completely different industry a completely different skill set and that's why you see so much happening in Silicon Valley and so much coming here to this show. Arvid, you must see it the same way. Last year at CES, Mercedes chose this show to be the one to really show off its fully autonomous yes, car. Right. So clearly you're you're heavily focused on that. Yeah, and we were very very surprised how much it was uh, taken as as a as a new message and it was very very great feedback. So I think it is, it is interesting to see how the digitization now really changes the vehicle, the mobile experience. On the other hand, we, I mean, we are all automotive, so you shouldn't forget there's always a vehicle behind it. There's lots of metal, there's a powertrain, there's luxury elements, which you, still you, can, need which all you that. cannot we do need by all software. That, right. So you still need lots of hardware, but it's, it's a very technological project, product. It's one of the products that has the most lines of code already without digitalization, more than an Airbus or a Boeing. Uh, aircraft, so it is a technological, highly sophisticated product, and it's the right platform to really see all the, the future possibilities of digitalization come to life, and that makes it so exciting. You know, Arvid, I really love what you said about, let's not forget that yeah. the automobile still <laughs> is an automobile. It's a very complex piece of hardware, yes, and we think about it as our core business, keeping a foot in today, and I love what you said as well, Frankie, about the future, having a foot in tomorrow, 
And the combination of those two, I think, is very powerful. You know, because we as automakers have an understanding of how to make these complex vehicles. And then we're overlaying on that the really exciting technology layers of software-enabled connectivity, the future mobility services that we can bring to our customers to make their lives better. That's a really wonderful combination. So it's really great to see all of us here at CES to make that really come alive. Absolutely. Ken, I got to believe, though, that this is changing the way that you run your R&D operations, or certainly how you deploy what you want to be developing and researching. It's creating an additional layer of excitement. And what's really neat about it is the excitement that comes with bringing these software innovations and connectivity and autonomous vehicles. It's, it's seeping into all aspects of our business. And so you see the guys working on core powertrain technologies get excited about, well, how can we alter our powertrains to enable the autonomous vehicles to have the better experience? It's seeping into our electrification strategy. And so I think it's really rising all, all boats, if you will. And that's why we think about innovation as innovating in every part of our business, you know, not just in autonomy or in mobility. It's really a, a company-wide initiative to focus on how do you bring software and, and technology innovations and business innovations to change people's lives with both our core product and in our new mobility services and con connectivity experiences. It's, re it's really about accelerating different concepts of your business model, like for example car sharing, many have not made car sharing for many years, others have started very early, like we did 15 years ago, but now it's accelerated so much because the technology is there, people get information much faster, digitalization allows for it, so now it really, now you call it disruptive, years back you would call it a new different business model, and now it's really over, all over the place because others can do the same, uh, same the new business model without having automotive manufacturing capabilities, and they're competing in s certain areas of the marketplace uh, now, now against one another, and they were different industries before. How do you make sure that you're putting your money on the right horse? And the reason I say that is, this technology is very disruptive, and even the disruptors are being disrupted by new disruptors coming in. Yeah. And the pace of change is faster than we've ever seen at any point in the history of the automotive industry. Frankie, how do you make sure that when you say, okay, we're going this way, that next week you don't go, hi yeah, yeah. why do we go with those guys? Look at this new thing that's come up. You got to make sure that your goals are aligned with the goals of the company that you're, that you're looking at. And for us, um, I think you're probably referring to the big announcement with Lyft and GM. You know, Lyft has the same attitude towards mobility that we do, and one of the things that we're looking at is, hey, you know, if you've got car sharing service in place, you can start to roll out things like autonomy. It benefits Lyft um, by not having to have as many drivers or to, to get it out to places where they don't have as many drivers. It benefits GM to get, you know, our vehicles into the hands of people who wouldn't necessarily be ready to buy a new vehicle right now gives people exposure to autonomy who are not ready to buy an autonomous car, but may try it for a 10 minute drive to the uh, drugstore and say, hey, wow. And so we make the investment in Lyft and say, okay, so what we're gonna do now is push you know, our autonomy roadmap forward connected with sharing. And we've also can play into the, the longstanding tradition we have with connectivity through OnStar to offer new services to both Lyft drivers and Lyft passengers. Ken, how do you make sure you're betting on the right horse? Well, you know, it's a great question, and, and, and so I'm not much of a betting man, so the, the key for us is to make sure that you stay agile and you can pivot when you need to. Uh, and so we, we created and we sort of stimulated a culture of, of innovation and experimentation, which is trying, a lot, trying out lots of different things, working with many partners and collaborators, and, the, and just moving forward with these experiments to see how they, how they evolve and see what works. And if it works well, you accelerate. If it doesn't work well, you pivot. And that's exactly what we've done with our mobility experimentation. We started with some more than two dozen experiments more than a year ago, and we announced that at CES last year. This year, we updated the, the situation by letting folks know that we pivoted and fo focused on bringing flexible use and ownership uh, services to our customers, and we're looking at multimodal solutions for urban environments. And it's, it's all about being agile and trying things and being willing to being willing to take risks. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just want to iterate on what you're saying, where you're talking about the, you know, offering the options and pivoting. You know, a lot of people ask all of us, you know, why are you guys getting into car sharing? Don't you want to continue to sell cars to individual drivers? That's not going to go away overnight. 
there's still that component. But if a lot of, you know, if a certain population of people who use cars or could use cars would benefit from not owning them, but using them, you know, as a service and a different mobility service, we all as OEMs want to be part of that. You know, we don't want to like watch somebody else do that part and then say, hey, wait a minute, you know, what happened to us? I, you know, I keep telling people we don't want to become Kodak. We don't want to say it's film or it's nothing. You know, you, you've got to look at where the industry's going and say we want, to, we want to continue to be a part of that. And yeah, the traditions that we uphold, those are going to continue to be in place for a while as well. And it's a very important cultural change for an automotive industry. So your question, how do you make sure you don't bet on, you bet on the right horse? I mean, if you ask a venture capital decision maker, how do you make sure? He will say, I, I know I'm going to miss on 90% of them, but 10% will be the ones. And this is what automotive industry is not used to. So it's a very big step to get going and to be able to, to, to do this, to pivot, to, to accelerate when needed. So it's very exciting for the cultural changes that the industry will see, be it in Michigan, be it in Germany, or other places where the big companies are, are hosted, or I think also in Japan. So it's going to be a very big change. And some of them have already happened, like starting car sharing very early with Car2Go, having new platforms, starting apps, uh, the, the idea of integrating the brand experience into a whole world, like Mercedes Me, like we're doing this. So many new aspects we wouldn't have thought of five years back. You know, and it's really interesting that all of us have uh, offices and, and presence in Silicon Valley yeah. where that's very normal. You know, that notion of mm -hmm. trying things out and experimenting and collaborating with others to bring innovations into your ecosystem and then, you know, building on the things that work and accelerating those that look good. Um, I think that's really a sign of the times that, that we all see opportunity of being in these natural environments where innovations just sort of happen naturally. Yeah. Uh, for us, car sharing was, was a, a very foreign thing, right? And so when we started experimenting, we started in London, where the car sharing need was there, pain points were there. Exactly. And it, that experiment ta taught us that, that if you do it in a one-way journey and you offer guaranteed parking to people and you make it easy and you just make it a good experience, people are going to love it. And they also, we also learned that they love electrified vehicles. People would not buy an electrified vehicle, but they tried it, to your point. Yeah. And once they tried it, they said, 97% say they, they, they do it again, or might even buy one. Yeah. And so that's a great example of how this experimentation culture can affect and enable our core business as well and teach us things that can rise all boats in terms of our core business. Exactly. It's going to be very exciting also to see how we find the right partners. So if we look at technology companies from this area, for example, chip companies showing us the newest computation technologies, the newest deep learning algorithms. If we want to partner up with one, as you say, the disruptors are being disrupted every day. So yeah. how do you make sure you can change the right point in time? So. It's a different, a different rhythm now. It's well, much, think, much faster. I think Ken said a, a critical word, ecosystem. You're, yes. you're operating in an ecosystem. If you go back to the old automotive model, it was do everything vertically integrated in-house, tell everybody else what to do. <laughs> then maybe some of it got outsourced, but they were still sort of in the Keiretsu or the system, right? That's now right. it's just like the ecosystem. You got to go out and play with whomever's out there. Yeah, and what's interesting, uh, John, is you know when we were first here at CES, you walk around the show floor and you say, hi, I'm from Ford, and they say, who? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's not quite that bad now, but, right. but the point is that we're part of a system now, and we're not like you know at the top of the pyramid of the supply base, and that means a different dynamic of interacting with the technology companies, which you know I'm excited about the fact we've got people walking the show floor building relationships, finding out what's out there, and, and so that we can identify new ways to bring these technical innovations into our services and to our vehicles. Yeah. Frankie, you said something interesting uh, just a minute ago about how car ownership's not going to go away overnight. Right. Let's take this conversation out 10 years. How do you see this all evolving? What's your vision of where this industry is going to be 10 years out? You know, I think that there's a lot of people for whom car ownership is, is either going to sort of go away or you know they're they're just not going to take it up as a as a as a tradition let's put it that way so there's a lot of younger drivers who because of various reasons including debt load aren't interested in buying a car right now and so car sharing is an option you look at older drivers and for those of us who have elderly parents or have had elderly parents the whole idea that at some point they have to give up their mobility because they can't drive anymore 
you know, having that kind of, you know, freedom to use mobility, you know, point to point and not deal with public transportation is wonderful. Um, I've done a lot of work in accessibility and work with people with disabilities. The number of people that you open up personal mobility to when mobility becomes a service is huge. I think there's still a lot of people who are going to want to own their own car if they can afford it, if it makes sense for them, if they're an enthusiast like me. There's, there's a lot of reasons to still own your own car, but there's a huge, you know, huge segments of the population who can benefit from what we're starting to offer. So. Arvid, same question to you. Where do you I, see I this think, going? Yeah, I think this will be, will be very specific looking at different markets. I mean, everybody assumes everybody's living in the city. That's not really the case. I mean, China, obviously, it is very different to uh, Europe. It's different to the U.S. So in the U.S., our research shows people still live mostly in suburbs. So there's a different traffic pattern than living, I don't know, in San Francisco, downtown, or, 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 or in downtown Manhattan, where you should not possibly not own a car. On the other hand, ownership is already a different concept today. It's about leasing, it's not necessarily buying, making the investment, so a big share of our customers don't actually buy a car and own it, but they lease it. So it, it's again a different situation. And then, uh, and in addition to that, we have this young generation that will decide when buying a mobility solution do I want to be perfectly connected or do I want to enjoy the ride as a ride? And we'll have, we'll have different customers doing the one thing or the other thing. And it's going to be exciting to see how, how, the, how this turns out. I think we cannot, we cannot uh, not neglect the new millennials coming up doing it differently. That's why we do all these things and we're trying out different concepts and we're talking to all these partners doing these things. On the other hand, we will still have, I think, a significant share in the market that wants to own a vehicle because they, they love the vehicle itself. Ken, 10 years out, where do you see this going? Well, I, I, I agree with both of my colleagues here that, that the future is going to have uh, a, this notion of choice and it's going to be based on region. Um, depending on where you are in your own life situation, you may be well positioned or might have a desire to buy and own your own car and I think that's going to be true for many years in the future. I, I think of you know, the analogy of the, the transition that happened when cars were first invented and became a commodity. You know, when our founder put the world on wheels, you know, people, if you ask, if they had asked, they would say, I want a faster horse, right? And, but that didn't mean horses went away. Uh, people still ride horses for fun and some still enjoy buying horses and owning horses. I think that analogy may not be perfect, but I think it's pretty close, where there'll still be personal car ownership, there'll still be hobbyists, and I think there'll still be, be regions where that's the only way yeah. it's practical to, to get around and be mobile. But I do think there will be a fairly significant segment of the, of the ecosystem that will be primarily services oriented, where you will get from point A to point B, either with multimodal solutions that are smartly stitched together, or you'll have a service that's based and enabled by fully autonomous vehicles that are very smartly designed and are, you know, allow you to get there very safely. And I so think it's an I, exciting future. Yeah, I think it's instructive to, to sort of look at, and this kind of touches on what you're talking about with multi uh, multi multimodal, is that you know some of us who even are car enthusiasts still use these mobility services from yes. time to time situationally. You know, if I go up to San Francisco, you know, maybe it's easier to take the train. Certainly, I only want to have to park my car once. I've taken Uber just to get across town and then get back to my car. Yeah. Come down to LA, exactly. it's, you're not going to drive across town. You're going to you're going to take Lyft. You're going to you know you're going to use another option. And so, if you've got even the people who are like, I'm never going to give up my car, using these services once in a while, think about the people who are you know maybe like oh, I don't know about the car. So I think there's a lot of use for both models. And if we're talking about ecosystems, the Think about it this way. I mean, there's an Apple ecosystem, there's an Android ecosystem. If, as all these services and mobility like merge into another one another, there might be automotive ecosystems. Like my way of traveling is the Mercedes Me way. If it's my own car, if it's a shared car, if it's a drive-driven car by a chauffeur, and what I do in the cars might be also within this ecosystem. So, and this might be cooperating with CarPlay, with Android Auto, whatever, or it might not. And maybe we see ecosystems evolving 
by automotive partners, for example. So that could be also well, well imaginable. Elaborate a bit more on that. I mean, I'm very curious as to where Mercedes is going, especially as you get into this mobility services. Yeah. I've got to believe that there's going to be a Mercedes standard of mobility service, not just the vehicle itself, yeah. but the service that goes along with it. Yeah, that's what we show with our Mercedes Me platform. So we want to put the customer in the focus, and then he can access all these different services that include, of course, a car, financing a car, leasing a car, using a car. And this is the interesting challenge to create new customer value that we haven't had so far in this whole environment, and you could call it ecosystem. I think people in Silicon Valley would call it disruptive ecosystems. And maybe that's the way automotive companies have to go. So building on that thought, I mean, I, I, I really love the notion of you know, connecting together different services. And that's why we, we at Ford, we think about mobility in the context, in the broader context of how does connectivity and data and analytics and autonomy and alternative mobility services, how do they all work together? How can they all complement each other to create these user experiences that people want and love? And so we think of all that together, because as you think about the future and the pain points that people have, um, they're, they're not going to care about the technology itself. What they care about is what it can do for them mm -hmm. and how it will enable their lives to be better. And so we're looking to bring all that together to solve those pain points, to create mobility services for people and mobility solutions for people that allow them to get to where they want to go and to have the experiences that they want and uh, that they'll want to repeat. So that's how we think about this ecosystem. Solution. And as you start thinking about the aspects of this, the services you create, you very quickly, I think you would agree, you come to the brand specific features that you would want because your brand stands for a certain thing. Your customer have experience with your brand. So Mercedes would design something completely different possibly from Ford and GM because we know our customers would like it. Your customers like something else. So it remains brand specific and it's a great potential to, to shape and to create a, a holistic brand experience every day, not right. only right. being driving. You know, another, another interesting dimension of that is that that the, the lifestyle or the life, the expectation of people who have digital devices in their lives, it, it's very, very seamless as they move from their home to their car and they're walking in their office. And so by putting the vehicle into their digital lifestyle, by, by making it a device on the Internet of Things and then making the connectivity in the vehicle, not just between the person's device in the vehicle and the car, but by connecting it to the rest of their digital life, it's going to change the whole experiences. And so we've started doing some experimentation with that. We announced here at CES our work with Amazon to integrate it into your smart home. So you can just talk to your car and ask it to do things in your home. Or when you're at home, you can talk to your home, have it do things to your car or query your car. I think that's a huge part of the future, having it be a part of your digital life. So Frankie, are we going to see us 10 years out not really talking about car companies as car companies, but something that has this ecosystem where everything's connected that happens to be branded, let's say Chevrolet or Cadillac or something like that. Well, I know that you know at GM, we, we sort of feel like we're moving into being a mobility company, and I think some of the other companies would probably say that that's the truth. But you know, you have to look at the fact that you know. I would say all of us have long traditions in manufacturing, in doing really wonderful things in terms of actually producing vehicles. And that's expertise that can be transferred to, you know, what the ecosystem is becoming and what, you know, vehicles are on the road and things like that. And it's not something that any of us are going to give up easily because why should we? It's, it's still a great, wonderful skill set that most people don't have. So. Arvid, I got to believe as somebody who runs R&D, th this is a huge challenge. I mean, did you ever think when you started your career that you'd be talking about these sorts of things? No, it's really the most exciting time in, history, in, in the automotive history at the moment. I mean, we, if you look 10 years back, we had electrification getting started, so running us uh, all, all uh, making us all excited in every, in every direction over the last uh, five to 10 years. And now it's digitalization, so it's amazing. And as, we, as you said, the next five years will be drastically changing everything. And everybody will immediately feel it. I mean, you might have not felt all the other evolvements in technology on an everyday basis, but this is what you're going to feel every day. That's really amazing. You know, and I'm a computer science person. I've always loved cars, but I'm a computer science person. I never thought I was going to be able to work for a car company, especially like my favorite car company, and then get to, you know, get to do really wonderful and amazing things with these vehicles. So. 
So let, let, let me let me show uh, two different perspectives. I had recently a discussion with a person from a chip company, and he said, looking at CES, it seems that cars become sexy again. And I say, cars have always been They've sexy. Always I, been I, sexy. I, I, yeah, I, I know you would agree. So maybe it's just that smartphones are not that sexy yeah. at the moment that we can help them out. Right. And, and you know, I, I'll tell you, my background is I'm a nuclear engineer, and so I have never imagined working not only for a car company, physics. but working <laughs> in this environment, changing how the world moves. Because to your earlier question, we are really thinking of ourselves as both a car company and a mobility company, because we are aspiring to enable our customers and people all over the world to move in better and, and more enjoyable ways. And it's an exciting time. What a great time to be working in this yeah. industry. Yeah, absolutely. No, I've, I, I totally agree. You know, as somebody who's been watching this industry my entire career, and as someone who got into this business as a hardcore enthusiast, I'm so excited about this technology. I'm, I'm so in awe of the pace of change. I've never seen anything like it. I, I think, Arvid, you said it. We have never seen this much technological change in the history of the yeah. industry. Right. And, and that's why I was asking where you all see this is going in another 10 years or so. I'll bet if we come back here in another couple of years and do the show all over again, we're going to have even more new and exciting things to be talking about. So I, I, I want to thank all three of you for having taken the time to sit down with me and, and share your thoughts. Ken Washington from the Ford Motor Company, uh, Frankie James from General Motors, Arvid Niestra from Mercedes-Benz. I want to thank you all for having shared your, your expertise with me today. It's our pleasure. Thank Thanks for having me. Very good. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in to AutoLine this week, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did.